How to Catch a Falling Star. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Larry Deneau, Atlas Project Senior Software Engineer at the University of Hawaii. Welcome, Dr. Deneau. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. D tell us about your background and how you became a part of the Atlas Project. Okay, so um, for Atlas, I'm kind of an astronomer and software engineer, and uh, my route into astronomy was sort of non-traditional. Uh, my background is actually in electrical engineering and uh, computer software way back right out of college. And uh, I worked for um, technology companies. I worked for dot-com back in the dot-com 1.0 days, um, did computer consulting. And in uh, early 2000s, um, a friend of mine um, at a company I used to work for had moved out to Hawaii and was working for the university on this uh, big telescope project called PanStars. And he, at the time, asked me if any, anybody who was working for me would be interested in this position. And uh, I looked at the position, and it was a software engineer database position for a big telescope project. And I thought, hey, I know how to do all of that stuff. Um, I would move to Hawaii. And so I called him back, and I said, hey, this looks actually pretty good to me. I mean, can we work something out? And he said, well, send a resume. Um, I talked to my wife about it. Um, we had a young child at the time. Um, and we said, let's give it a shot. And so uh, I took this position, you know, basically doing database software and like web front end um, and some astronomy programming for an asteroid survey. And I've been doing that now. We're on year 15 of a uh, two year plan. So it's worked out well. Uh, we're really happy here. And I transitioned to a different project now, this Atlas project. We're doing similar stuff. I write software, we search for hazardous asteroids. Um, and every day I love coming to work. So then let's talk a little bit about the Atlas project. What is Atlas and how does it perform its mission? So Atlas is a uh, part of the NASA planetary defense program. Um, and our mission is to find hazardous asteroids. That's the general mission of the planetary defense office. Um, Atlas fits in in that we're specifically designed to find asteroids that are on a, um, we call them a death plunge trajectory. So they're on their final trajectory um, on an Earth impact. And uh, the current or previous survey assets that are out there, so PanStars, my original project is one of them. There's another one in Tucson, Arizona called Catalina Sky Survey. They're the most prolific ground-based asteroid surveys. Um, they look for, they're building the catalog of hazardous asteroids by looking for things that might hit us years from now or decades from now even. Um, but there's kind of a hole in the net for things that are right on top of us about to hit us. And these objects tend to be small. Um, because the smaller objects are much more numerous than the larger ones. Um, and our specialty is uh, to find these things that are several days to several weeks out from hitting us. Wow, that's soon. What technologies did you have to design or invent or utilize to bring Atlas online? So what made our program possible, the Atlas project possible, is that we're really taking advantage of all of the you know, advances in computer technology that we're used to. So um, computers have become much, you know, they continue to fall in price and become more and more powerful. Um, our detector is a 10,000 by 10,000 pixel CCD, monolithic CCD that's very, very sensitive. Um, we've uh, got a design for our telescope that lets us see a large part of the sky at relatively high resolution. So that means that we can basically raster the sky, um, the entire visible sky from Hawaii every two nights looking for asteroids. And that's a, a cadence or interval that uh, until now has never been done um, looking at the entire sky. So we're able to actually monitor the sky and it's all through the use, you know, through modern computer technology, which continues to get cheaper and better. So Atlas for NASA is a relatively inexpensive program uh, to look for hazardous asteroids. How do you use algorithms to find individual asteroids among thousands of images and thousands or thousands of stars? Uh, exactly, right. So, um, so our telescope takes about a thousand pictures a night. Each uh, image is about um, 200 megabytes uncompressed. So, um, and we have two telescopes operating here in Hawaii, one on Haleakala, which is on Maui, and the other on the Big Island. And so these two telescopes produce about a quarter terabyte of data every night that's got to be downloaded from the summits and analyzed. And uh, the basic way we find asteroids in our data is, uh, imagine a single astronomical image that has um, several million stars in it. That's typical for one of our exposures. Um, if you come back to that same part of the sky, exactly the same part of the sky, and take the same picture, 
um, all of those stars will still be there. And uh, the things that will, um, there'll be asteroids in that field and they'll look like stars except that they've moved a little bit. So the way we find uh, asteroids is we go to the same part of the sky four times in a row, separated by say 10 minutes. And um, we very carefully um, uh, align the images and then do an image subtraction, um, which results in all of the stars subtracting out. And what you have left are things that are moving because they're not in any of the previous images. And then um, from those images, we actually measure the locations of those things that look like moving objects. And from there, um, we basically play dot to dot in this catalog space looking for things that are moving in roughly a straight line uh, in space. And uh, those are candidate um, asteroids. Um, we see uh, tens of thousands of known asteroids every night. And we automatically identify those and send them to the, a place called the Minor Planet Sensor, which is kind of the clearinghouse for all observations of uh, small bodies in the solar system. So planets, uh, satellites of planets, uh, comets. Um, but when we have an asteroid that we think has a motion that suggests that it's a near Earth asteroid, and I'll tell you what that means in a second, then we submit it to uh, the Minor Planet Center again, but to a special place there called the Near Earth Object Confirmation Page. And what that is is a place where other observatories can find out about brand new uh, discoveries of near Earth asteroids that need to be followed for several days or weeks in order to get a really precise trajectory for them. So our job as a survey is to find them on that first night and then hand them off to follow up telescopes to follow them. And over several days or a few weeks, um, the orbit of those asteroids will be known very, very precisely and they'll be put in the catalog. So talk about the near Earth. I mean, what, what, are, we, what are we talking about here? I mean, you said uh, two weeks, potentially a really narrow window. Um, what happens if one of these actually is identified? How much, how much time might we actually have to be prepared to evacuate? And what's the process or warning uh, system uh, for the planet of potential impact? So, um, so as you might expect, um, the, um, the rates that these things occur um, is uh, size dependent. So large objects, you know, say dinosaur killers will happen every, say, you know, few million years. Um, but a uh, asteroid the size of a basketball hits the Earth every single day. Um, and a rule of thumb I like to use, and it's, it's approximate as, you know, you have a basketball hitting the Earth every day, you have a car-sized object hitting the Earth maybe once a year, and a house-sized object, you know, maybe once every 10 to 50 years. And, the, you know, those numbers are approximate. Um, so to answer your question about warning time, um, it depends on the size of the asteroid and how reflective it is. And the asteroids come in a variety of both sizes, of course, and reflectivities. So an asteroid that's reflective, and you will be able to see it farther away, or an asteroid that's bigger will also be able to see far away. So, um, you know, a larger one that's more dangerous, the good news is that we'll be able to see it sooner, you know, maybe a few weeks out instead of a few days out. Um, and then the, the mitigation really depends on um, precisely how big it is, how dense it is. So some asteroids are kind of, let's say, dirt cloudy. You know, they can kind of fall apart and they're crumbly. Um, other ones are really made of um, iron. And so you can imagine an iron asteroid that's the size of a car um, is going to get a lot farther down the atmosphere than something that's kind of a dirt cloud. And so the, um, the asteroid that hit in Russia about six years ago in Chelyabinsk, that was about a house-sized asteroid. Um, it was not made of iron, so it did not make it all the way to the ground. And so the injuries that happened, and the, the, um, the shockwave and all of that came from the air burst. So the asteroid disintegrated in the atmosphere. Um, it made a huge flash. Everybody ran to their windows to see this flash. And then a couple of minutes later, the shockwave from that blast hit all of the windows. And that's how everybody was injured. Um, there were no actual direct injuries from the asteroid. It was all from the shock blast. Um, so it gives you an idea of an asteroid that size, how much damage it can do. If that asteroid had been made of iron, it would have made it all the way to the ground and probably put a gouge through the city somewhere. So we're really lucky that didn't happen. Um, but before you, know, you evacuate a city, you want to have a good idea of how big the thing is and um, how dense it is um, so that you understand what the ramifications are. What is your biggest challenge right now and what needs to happen in the future to maybe speed up the process or get better at making some of those um, determinations? So there's a lot of places where the whole system can get better and um, it's continuing to get better. Um, and NASA 
has cooperation from, you know, of course, the U.S. government, um, from other international astronomical organizations. So the, the problem has become, it has global visibility now. I mean, of course, you know, the, the last few that we know about have hit in Russia um, that have made it to the ground, um, the last few big ones anyway. And so Russia is very keen to, you know, help in this effort. And all of the space agencies, you know, are really involved in it. So areas where we can get better are, so the one in Chelyabinsk in Russia six years ago, that came from the sun side of the Earth. So there's no way that a nighttime survey can see any of those asteroids. So that's like 30% of the sky that we're blind to. So the way to solve that is to put a spacecraft um, that's, you know, uh, in the right spot looking for asteroids that are on the sun side. So this would be somewhere between the sun and the Earth, looking toward the Earth, seeing things that are coming um, into view as they come from the sun side. Um, additionally, um, these small asteroids that are uh, car sized but can still do some damage um, can have, they might have visibilities that are only a few days because they're so small that you only see them when they're very up close. And so continuing to observe more rapidly, more frequently um, helps there. So Atlas in particular is, uh, we're funded to build two more telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere. And we're working on that now and these will be constructed in late 2020. But when those telescopes come online, we'll have two more eyes looking at the sky at night, which means that instead of every two days looking at the sky, we'll be able to look at the sky every single day. And that means that the, the hole in the net, let's say, uh, becomes smaller. It's harder for them to sneak by unnoticed when we're looking more frequently. Dr. Larry Deneau, Atlas Project Senior Software Engineer at the University of Hawaii. Thank you so much for joining. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out more about the progress you're making. How can they do that? Uh, the first place I would send them is to our website, which is fallingstar.com. Um, that's the Atlas Project website from there. Um, there are links to uh, email uh, address where you can reach us um, and our Twitter page. You can follow us there. I think we're Falling Star IFA uh, on Twitter. Um, and if you send a message there, it'll get to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Sounds good. Thanks again for your time. And if you guys want to follow me, you can do that by going to tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.